may be seated this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to take them out and turn them to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. As we've been going through 1 Peter verse by verse, we've come to a section over the last several sermons in 1 Peter where Peter has been teaching what it looks like to live to honor God in various aspects of life. He talked about government, he talked about work, and he's talking about home. Last week, it was the wives' turn. And ladies, you got six verses. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. Guys, today it's your turn. I hope you brought a helmet. And uh, you get one verse. Do you know why that is? No, it's not because you have to tell the women more frequently. It's because we men need it simple. We need it concise. We need it right in our face, and I think that all of the apostles, especially Peter, probably knew that, knowing what we know about his personality and temperament. So we get one verse, but don't worry, gentlemen, there is plenty, plenty to unpack today. This is to married men. This is to Christian husbands. If you are in that category of Christian husband, this is specifically related to you today. If you are here as a lady, whether married or single, there will be some things that you will be able to learn and grow from in relation to this. Single ladies, it will be great for you to understand what you're looking for in your future husband, as I think most of you have those aspirations. So it will be good for you. Uh, Married ladies, this is not for you to hold over your husband's head, as we discussed last week, but this is for you to pray for them for. And the reason that I say that is because these are the very hardest sermons for a preacher to preach. For a preacher who's also a husband, um, has been a husband for now almost 19 years. Wow, really? Wow. Some of you are like, you're over 19? Yeah. That used to be funnier. (laughs) But honestly, I told my wife on Tuesday, I said, this is going to be a really tough week. Because if I'm honest with you, husbands, as I open this text and I study this one verse and I open the commentaries and do the word studies and think about the implications and the applications and I talk about, I think to myself what it means to to preach this to you, and I don't mean this in a false sense of like false humility, like this is heavy for me as a husband. Like all week I've just been confronted with my own weaknesses, my own shortcomings, my own sin issues in relation to like what it means to be a husband. And so this is not a pastor coming up to, to, to like pound other men over the head with some scripture verse. This is us understanding what God expects and what we should all aspire to. And I want you to know that I, like, I'm standing here humbled by God's word this week and I've had conversations with my wife like, uh, how we doing? <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> right? Uh, because this is, is so heavy. But it's a good and an encouraging message if we think of it in terms of not only, as the sermon title says, the husband that every woman wants, but the husband that God desires and the husband that God expects. These can be things that we can live toward. So we'll get right to work today. And like I said, only one verse, but there will be three points to the one verse. And I'll put them on the screen along with the corresponding scripture. The first thing that God wants and what your wife wants from you is to be an understanding husband. The first part of verse 7 says this, Likewise, husbands. And so he's given some commands to various different groups of people. And he's going to give a a command now to husbands. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't an idea. These aren't three steps to a healthy marriage. These aren't follow this if you feel like it or only when you feel like it. This is a command from God to us as men. And we need to hear it as that. I've heard people say that sometimes like soft words can produce hard hearts, but that hard words can produce soft hearts. And that's what we need sometimes as men. We need hard words spoken in love to produce soft hearts in us. And that's what Peter is going to do here. If the marriage relationship is, like I say every time I do a wedding, the highest human relationship, it's the only relationship of which Scripture says the two shall become one flesh. The marriage relationship between a man and a woman is the highest human relationship. And if that is so, as husbands, if we are called to lead in that context— We have the heaviest burden of anyone on earth in leading a family. 
The most important job that I do in my whole life, the most important role that I have is the husband to my wife. And so we need to hear commands, not suggestions. We need to hear truth, not ideas. We need to hear God's word, not just another perspective. And that's what we get in the words of Scripture. And he says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. This is daily, as you're doing life daily, and as you're living with your wife and, and doing the daily life that you do, you're supposed to do it in an understanding way. And let me, let me unpack that word understanding. Some of your translations say the word considerate, right? Live w in, a, in a considerate way, and we get some ideas as to what it means to be considerate with someone else. Understanding actually means like knowledgeable. And, and the, the root in the Greek word there is, is where we get the word knowledge. Live with your wife in a knowledgeable way. It takes a lot to, to get to know a woman. Men? That there you go. Thank you. That was your cue, right? That was your cue. One brave guy. It takes a lot to get to know a woman. And we will expound on that in just a moment. But when, when you think about living with your wife in a knowledgeable way, there's this idea of, like, engaging your brain, right? Like, you've got to, like, turn your brain on as it relates to her, which is really easy in the dating period, the courtship period. You want to get to know everything about her. You want to talk and spend time with and, and spend time just hanging out and all of those things. And then your first year of marriage and the first few years of marriage— but then when you get like five years in, 10 years in, 15 years in, 50 years in, right? And you realize, man, I still got a lot to learn. And I've talked to older men who've been married for a long time, and they're like, I got a lot to learn. And I'm like, if you have a lot to learn, what about me? And I'm in the most dangerous spot right now because I'm in that spot in life where I've got a few gray hairs, and I got 19, almost 19 years under my belt. So I am like just at that point where I am dumb enough that I can actually think that I know what's going on, right? Younger guys should be smart enough to realize, like, I don't have a clue as to what's going on. Older guys have walked that road long enough to know I don't know what's going on. But right here in the middle, as many of us are, you're in that, like, 10 to 20, 25 years of marriage. Danger zone, because you might think you actually have a clue, Right? And he says, live with your wives in an understanding, a knowledgeable, a considerate. Another way, an another word is an intelligent way. Can you imagine if we lived with our wives in an intelligent way? Like wives, can you imagine what your life would look like if your husband lived with you intelligently? You shouldn't be laughing that much. Yes. There's, there's another word. And these are all, this is all part of like just doing like word studies. This is actually what the Bible says. The word is sensitive. Living with your wife in an understanding way is being sensitive. How many sensitive men do we have in the audience today? Do we have some sensitive? It's okay. Come on, we got a few sensitive men. Like we need to have some because it's biblical, right? But to live with your wife in a sensitive way means to be sensitive to her. Sensitive to her needs, her differences, her wants, her desires. All of that is wrapped up in living with your wife. And he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. Here's what one commentator said. I like this, so I wrote it down. He said that you're called to recognize the difficult road that she's been called to walk. Okay, look at yourself in the mirror, men, right? Look, recognize the difficult road she's been called to walk. Do this with me. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. Recognize the difficult road she's been called to walk and recognize what makes her feel loved and valued. That's part of living with your wives in an understanding way. Understanding your wife is not this abstract thing. A few laugh there. <laughs> it feels abstract sometimes. It comes from personal experience, right? It comes from personal encounter, personal experience. It takes continued study. It means being a student of your spouse. Continued pursuit. So those are some of the words. You're continuing to get to know her. So I told you I have three points. And for each of those points, because we're men and we need it very simple, I need it very simple, I'm going to give us some practical suggestions 
for applying that point, okay? So here's some practical ways that you can understand, live your, your wife in an understanding way. Number one, understand her distinctiveness as a woman. You, you men realize you're married to women and they're different from men. There's a secular book years ago that was called Men Are From, Women Are From, and if you're not sure, those are two different planets. The idea was that they were far, far apart, right? And that may not be a specifically Christian book, but we Christian men can say, yeah, men are from Mars, women are for, from Venus. They're planets far, far from each other. I used, uh, there was a meme that went around, and it said for a man there was an on-off switch. And interpret this however you want, but don't take it too far. There was just like an on-off switch, on-off. For women, there was like this whole control panel, right? Buttons and switches and knobs and all this. I'm like, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I get that now. Understand your wife's distinctiveness. What makes her distinct? And, and he'll even talk about that. But make sure to stick. You're not living with one of your buddies, right? You're not living with just yourself. We always, again, when I do marriage, I said, you know, God created man. He said everything was good. But then he looked at man. He said, oh, that's just not good. He's alone. And it's going to get worse. It's just going to go downhill from here. And he created woman. And I always say, like, he didn't create a golden retriever, a dog to come in to be man's best friend. He didn't create a buddy for him to hang out with and eat chicken wings and play video games and whatever. No, he, he created the only relationship that he saw as fit to call good, and that was the relationship with woman. Understand that distinctiveness. There's another way, and, and that's to understand how she thinks. Again, did you realize that men and women think differently, right? Understand her feelings. Understand her needs. I remember this, this like got brought home to me one day because my wife was at work and a stressful job. She comes home and she's like in tears because of some of the things that were going on at her job. And she's in the bedroom and I walked in and I was going to help her. And I had a good heart. And I, she needed me to help and I was going to understand her and so I went in and I said, baby, what's the matter? And she told me what was going on. And I immediately did what all men do because we understand. And I started telling her how to fix it. Well, what you need to do is just go tell that person dot, dot, dot. And then you, you could go here and da, da. And then she's crying harder. And I thought, I'm not helping here, right? And what I needed to do was, again, take the earbuds out of my ears and put them in my mouth and just listen. I was on the right track when I said, baby, what's the matter? If not another word had come out of my mouth that night, I'd have been fine. But I kept talking. And guys, when you keep talking, that's the problem, right? Sometimes living with your wife in an understanding way, and I mean this in all seriousness, is asking more questions than you give answers. Oh, that is hard for me as a man. I had a friend a few years ago, and he walked several of us in this church through this exercise at a men's retreat where we had to get together, and there were two of us, and he put a, like a topic, like your favorite hobby, on the board. And the one guy was the question asker, and the other guy was the question answer. And the guy who could only answer questions, or could only ask questions and not say anything else. He couldn't talk about how he liked his hobby. He couldn't talk about it. He just had to ask questions. And I watched grown men have panic attacks that day. Because they couldn't talk about themselves. They had to ask questions. The exercise went on for three minutes. You had to ask questions for three minutes. And I saw men, including myself, like terror-stricken, that we had to ask questions and we couldn't talk about ourselves for three minutes. As men, we want to fix. We want to give answers. We want to do all of those things. And one of the best things that we can do to live with our wives in an understanding way is to ask more questions than we give answers. We can understand their love language, if you've heard that terminology before. One of the ways we live in an understanding way with our wives is to understand what makes them feel loved, right? For some of you men, the, the most loving thing that you can do for your wife right now is, you, this is really practical. As soon as you go home, you can do this. You go and you get a pair of rubber gloves. You put those on. And you get a toilet brush. And you grab that sucker. And you, maybe you get a bucket. And you put some cleaning supplies in it. And you're standing there with all of that, and you have never looked better to her. <laughs> right? Ladies? This happens to me. I try to exercise. I try to eat right. I try to do all these things. I groom and all of this stuff. And my wife tells me I look the best when I got a toilet bowl brush and a, and a bunch of cleaning supplies. Man, okay, I get amens from ladies. This is good. But here's the thing. 
gentlemen, our wives understand and hear love differently. For some of them, it's acts of service. For some of them, they could care less about that. They just want you to tell them nice things, right? And, and, and their words of affirmation, and maybe it's gifts or whatever it is. But understanding your wife really practically speaking is how does she understand love? Maybe a good idea to read the five love languages. There are some don'ts in relation to understanding your wife. Don't be disconnected and distant, right? Let's do away with that stereotype of men who just work all day and then come home long enough to say what's for dinner and then go sit in the chair with the newspaper or the iPad with the newspaper on it or out in the garage and never spending time with their spouse. Don't be disconnected and, and distant husband, right? Don't be the inconsiderate husband who's always thinking about yourself and your own wants and your own desires and your own dreams and your own hobbies and your own everything, your own way of life and never thinking about her and what she desires. There's a word called flourishing, and men's job is to create flourishing in creation. That's from Genesis 1 and 2 as well. But part of that is to help your wife to flourish, to be the best that she can be. So don't be inconsiderate. Don't be mean-spirited. There's a great illustration, and I didn't come up with it. I've read it. I've seen it several different times. But it's a great illustration to help you to think about how to live with your wife in an understanding way. There are different postures that couples take with each other. And I was going to have somebody come up, but I, I will refrain from that. But I want you to think about a, a couple who's standing up here back to back, the husband and wife. And they're back to back with their arms folded, right? Some couples live their lives back to back. They may be like fighting, like actually fighting and, and angry with each other all the time in the home is just like lots of fighting and arguing, that's back to back. Sometimes back to back is just that the husband, as I said, is distant or the wife is distant and they've separated uh, emotionally from each other even though physically they still live in the same household and they live back to back. They don't do things together, spend time together, work together. She does her life and he does his life and then they live back to back. Back-to-back -back is the worst place that a couple can be because it's only a step away from separation. Back-to-back -back is not an understanding way to live with your spouse, but there's another way that spouses live that's not the best way, and that's if I was standing here and my wife was standing right beside me shoulder to shoulder. Most couples live their lives, most of their lives, shoulder to shoulder especially when you're in that busy season of life from the time you start having kids until the time you get them all out of the house and then they keep wanting to come back, so I'm told. Okay? But shoulder to shoulder means this. Shoulder to shoulder is you're working on the same goal, raising the kids, keeping everybody happy, keeping the bills paid, making sure that everything happens. You're working on the business of life, the business of marriage, the business of family, and you're shoulder to shoulder with each other but you're not talking about life and working on your marriage and, and like loving each other and caring for each other. And shoulder to shoulder is an even more dangerous place to be sometimes because that's that place of complacency that you can get. And when you're back to back, you know you've got problems. But sometimes when you're shoulder to shoulder and you're just plowing through life, sometimes you can feel like everything's okay, but what will actually happen is as you go down the road, you drift apart. You drift more and more and more until you look and the other person's nowhere to be found. But shoulder to shoulder is essential at times, right? There are times when the job's just got to get done. But where you want to strive to spend time in relationship with each other is face to face. It's talking to each other, across a table from each other, on a date night, or even at the house, or wherever you can find some quiet space and time face-to-face, -face, asking questions about life, asking questions about what does she want and what does she need and how am I doing and what can I do better, face-to-face -face time where you're working on your marriage with each other. And for most of us, that's the hardest place to find time, but it's the most important place to invest time. One of the best ways that we husbands can live in an understanding way with our wives is this week to, to commit to get some face time with your spouse, right? Commit to getting some time where it's just the two of you, no distractions, and, and you're asking her some questions, you're talking about important life things together. That's how to live with your spouse in an understanding way. Number two, he talks about not only an understanding husband, but a respectful husband. He says this, showing honor to the woman 
as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Let's unpack some of those words, because I know that they can be a little bit distressing. The word honor is an important word. Let me tell you what honor means a little bit. Again, some of yours say respectful. Some of your translations say respectful. When you honor something, you value that thing highly. What do you value, right? That's a good question to think about. What are the things that you value highly? Men, what is it? Is it that special gun or other weapon that you have? Is it that vehicle that you have, that fishing rod or that boat or that thing? To value something highly, to set a high price on it, to give it worth, to treat it as precious, right? There are plenty of things in our lives that we, we treat as precious. When it says showing honor to the woman, to show honor to your wife, is to treat her as precious. It's the opposite of, of treating her shamefully or disgracefully or dishonoring her. But that's what showing respect means. And it's interesting because where it says showing, that word showing is actually always used to refer to something that's due from one person or to another. When it says showing honor, it's not talking about, again, just a nice idea that every time that that's used in a biblical context, that word in the original language that's translated showing or giving, it's used where honor is being given from one person to another person because it's due. Your wife deserves your honor. Yeah, but she's mean and a bad cook. She still deserves your honor, right? If she doesn't get up and make me breakfast. She doesn't pack my lunch for me, and she, she doesn't clean off all of my messes and do all the things. She's not supposed to, right? She deserves your honor. Our wives deserve our honor. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That's the part I'm just going to skip because it's real controversial. So we're going to move on. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. This has been variously interpreted and variously understood in lots of bad ways, including in my own life, and I will share with you what that is. But what I want everybody to hear loud and clear is that when it says showing honor to her as the weaker, to the woman as the weaker vessel, that idea of weaker vessel cannot cannot denote intellectual, moral, or spiritual inferiority. Okay? It cannot denote moral inferiority, intellectual inferiority, spiritual inferiority. How do I know that? Because God created mankind, men and women, in His image. He created us all in His image. This text is not teaching that women are somehow morally or intellectually inferior. And here's what I'll tell you as a pastor, that in my own mind, subconsciously, for 42 years, as I've been reading the Bible and studying the Bible and understanding the Bible and taking classes and all those things, without knowing it until this week, in my subconscious mind, although I wouldn't have said it, I, I really thought that when Eve took the bite of the apple— and then gave, gave it to Adam, that when Eve did that, like that was a spiritual inferiority thing, and that what Peter was referring to here when he said that she was the weaker vessel was that somehow like women were, were almost spiritually inferior. Yeah, look what Eve did. And I wouldn't have voiced that, but subconsciously in my mind, like I'm studying this scripture, and that's the thing that God really zinged me with this week. It's saying like, no, we're all on the same page, spiritually speaking, Right? There's no one righteous, not even one, no one who understands, no one who seeks God, right? Scripture is clear. Jew, Greek, man, woman, all of us. And so what I had to do is like repent and say, God, if that's come out like in my teaching or in my living or in my dealing with my wife and my girls, like that can't be. He's not saying that women are somehow spiritually inferior because of something that happened then. That we're all on the same page. We're all in the, the same boat. And here's some cool things. That the New Testament never follows this pagan idea that women were morally and, and, and intellectually inferior. As a matter of fact, you can read guys like Plato and Aristotle. You can read many of the ancient writers from various different cultures and the thing that sets the New Testament apart from them and the life of Jesus apart 
was the value and the dignity with which it treated women. You see, this book gets trashed as being like somehow misogynistic or somehow chauvinistic and, and, and down on women. And nothing could be further from the truth. When, when Peter even penned these words and he wrote to women, I told you last week he was giving them value because people didn't do that in that day. When he looked at husbands and he said, men, honor your wives, be respectful to your wives, that was a mind-blowing concept in Greco-Roman culture because Greco-Roman men had an inferior view of women. And he was actually lifting them up. And there's an illustration, and actually it was not mine. I didn't come up with it, but it was given to me this morning by someone who's older and much wiser than I am. And I think it really works. And he even lent me these two things. That this is a coffee mug. And they're very important. Amen? It can be tea as well. Okay. Right, Merle? Tea. Yeah. Okay. This, is, this coffee mug is good for a lot of things, right? Like, I can take this mug, pour hot something in it. I can pour cold in it. I can throw it in the microwave 15 times. If I needed to, I could use this to dig. Did you know this? You could finish your coffee, and if you had this in your car and you got stuck in the snow or dirt, you could actually get out and you could use this for digging. You could get yourself out of a jam with this. If I got into a really bad fight, I could smash this and fight with it and not feel too bad because it's going to be, like, replaced. Not that I've ever done that or been in a situation where I should. Woo! Okay? This is utilitarian. If I needed to, I could probably put it down. No, I'm just kidding. I could probably stand on it if I needed to, right? This mug is a man. Okay? Brutal. It's got a few chips in it, some stains. There's a lot of issues with it. This denotes man. This, on the other hand, is beautiful and delicate and important. This is valuable. I would not break this in a fight because the owner of it would then break me even if I won the fight, okay? This has a distinct purpose. And, and some will have a problem with this illustration. Many from the world will have a problem with this illustration. When Peter says to give honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about, he's talking about physical difference. Physical difference difference physical vulnerability i said to the person who gave me this like I, I can't do the jewish wedding feast thing with this right wrap it in a towel and smash it like no like like there's a vulnerability as i stand here even which one of these two am i worried about dropping i could drop the coffee mug most likely i can just pick it back up right yes and in that day there was also a social aspect to their vulnerability that it was there and that's what Peter is talking about when he talks about the idea of the weaker vessel. And he says, show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. He's saying that there is, in fact, a, an, a level of vulnerability. He says that they are heirs with you of the grace of life. And that is a statement that's important because it's a statement of equality. That when you look at both of these, not one or the other is inherently more valuable, although you could say that probably one costs more, right? But he's not trying to lift up one at the expense of the other, that both of them have different roles, and they're equally valuable as they do the roles that they were intended to do. When he says that they were heirs together with you of the grace of life, he's talking about the fact that God sent his son Christ to die in our place for our sins, and that extends to all men, to men and to women, Right? And there's an equality in that piece. So there are some practical ways, men, that you can honor and be respectful to your wives. The first one is this. It's simply to reject passivity. Like if there's one thing that we could talk a lot about today, it's the idea of rejecting passivity. Passivity is what has gotten tr got us in trouble in the garden, as I pointed out last week, that Adam was present, but he was passive, and he just stood there. We need to reject passivity in spiritual life. I want to say a word to so many who I know are here, ladies, who are raising your children and providing the spiritual influ influence and guidance for your families. You are doing an incredible job. You are doing a vital job. My own mother had it like an intense spiritual influence on my life at vulnerable times and still does. 
you are doing a good job. And you need to hear that if that's you today. Because maybe you're hearing this message to husbands and saying, yeah, but what about me? You're doing what you can do and God will bless you for that. But men, we need to reject passivity as Christian men. Spiritually speaking, we need to take the initiative to read those Bible verses with our little kids, to explore those spiritual questions with our teenagers, to get everybody up and get them to church. We need to take the spiritual initiative, reject passivity and accept that responsibility, initiate. There is an aspect of protection that needs to happen. I believe that there's an aspect of physical protection that needs to happen, that, that Christian husbands respectfully living with their wives there's an aspect of physical protection that needs to happen. Like, if there's a loud noise outside at night, I don't hand her the mag light, right? Right? She'd probably do better out there, but I'm still going to go out and take one for the team. Yeah. Like, there's an aspect of protection. That's why yesterday, I'm at the mall. I, this is two weeks in a row, okay? I don't love the mall. But I'm at the mall because there are some young ladies that wanted to go to the mall. And I'm just not ready yet. Some would call me helicopter dad. I'm okay with that, right? Especially when I go to the mall and I see what's at the mall, okay? But there's an aspect of protection. Dad, don't abdicate that responsibility with your young kids. Like, as it pertains to their use of social media, as it pertains to their use of cell phones and technology and the books that they read, don't abdicate that protection responsibility. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility, we got a book on prayer at my house the other day because someone wanted a book on prayer. It's a book for teens on prayer. Before I just toss that book to my kid, I'm going to look through that to check it out and see and make sure, right? Like, don't abdicate that responsibility. Reject the passivity. Take that leadership. And here's what's interesting is sometimes people think, like, you've got to have a, a lot of books. You've got to really love to read and study and do all of those things to be a spiritual leader. No. Some of the best spiritual leaders in this room and some of the best spiritual leaders that I know were not book guys. They were not guys who loved to study and open lots of books, stand in front of people and talk and all of those things. They were just really good men who were really good with their hands and working and fixing things, and they really loved the Lord. And they were faithful at loving the Lord, and they were faithful at leading other people, their family, to love the Lord. And some of them were really quiet men, and others of them were not as quiet men. But again, this is not just talking about a personality. This is talking about just, again, taking that role and taking that as initiative. That's how you can be respectful to your spouse. There are definitely some don'ts. Don't be disrespectful. Don't saddle them with unfair expectations. Don't intimidate. Colossians three nineteen, where Paul is giving um, some instructions to husbands about their wives. He says, don't be harsh. Because that's, th that, that's part of being again like being a man is that we can be intimidating and we can get our way through intimidation and we can because we're physically bigger in in most cases stronger than our wives okay that what can happen is that we can be try to be intimidating and that's not okay part of being honorable and respectful to your wife is not allowing that to happen just because you can doesn't mean that you should right so being respectful and then the last one is this, is to be spiritually minded. A spiritually minded husband. It says, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. The implication here is that the man is, in fact, praying. The implication is that the man is a Christian and that he has a relationship with the Lord and that he's praying, that he's spiritually minded, that he's walking with the Lord. And that his relationship with his wife is an indicator of his relationship with his God. You see, I think our marriage relationship is a reflector of our relationship with the Lord. I have a really hard time having a good relationship with the Lord, going into my office and praying or studying scripture if I just got in a fight with my wife, right? Or if I was just a jerk, which doesn't happen, but I mean, theoretically, like if it did, <laughs> right? But if I do something that's mean-spirited, or I'm just cranky and a grump, as you can imagine, that happens from time to time. Like, I have a really hard time being grumpy and mean and obnoxious and saying something that I shouldn't say, and then going and being like, Lord, give me the word for our people this week. It's difficult. 
Yeah. Because our spiritual life is a reflection, our marriage life is a reflection of our spiritual life. How I approach my marriage relationship says something about my spiritual life. And the prayers here are probably, like generally speaking, his prayers with his wife, his prayers for his wife, his prayers with and for his family, and his, his own personal prayer life, and spiritual life, okay? And this is not like, well, if I'm nice to my wife, then God will answer my prayers. Some of us are thinking, wait a minute, this is very transactional. No, no, this is as you live with her in an understanding way, as you show respect to her as God desires you to show respect, as you are spiritually minded in the way that God desires for you to be spiritually minded, you're a spiritually minded man who leads his wife and his family well. And if you're a young man, this is the, the man that you aspire to be. And if you're a young lady, this is the young man that you aspire to be with. And if you're a husband who's married today, if you're a man who's married and, and are a husband, and your wife is with us today, I mean, she's still alive today, this is, this is your job, this is your expectation. If you're a widower, you're an older man whose wife has passed away, or you're single, you have the opportunity to speak into the lives of younger men and to, to be a model in that way. That what we need is spiritually minded men Leading and teaching spiritually minded men and spiritually minded men leading their families Spiritually minded men respecting their wives and being understanding with their wives Rejecting passivity accepting the responsibility that it is that God has given us and being the men that God Desires for us to be and here's the thing that as those things happen as we're Understanding and we live with our wives in an understanding way as we show honor to her as the weaker vessel and as we are spiritually minded We'll be the husband that every woman wants. But more importantly, we will be the husband that God expects. That's the expectation that God has for us as Christian husbands from his word. And it's a hard word, but it's a valuable. I can't think of a more valuable calling. I, I love this. And I, and I take seriously the calling that God has given me to proclaim his word. But not as seriously as I take the calling to be a husband to my wife and a father to my kids it is a high calling that we've been given men and that's why i'll close by saying this that we can't do it on our on our own without the grace of god in our lives without the grace of god and the power of the holy spirit i don't have a prayer i don't have a chance like, I can't muscle my way into this thing as much a, as, as I want to be able to control it as a man. Ephesians 5, 25 and following is the longest passage that we have in the Bible directed especially at husbands and how they treat their wives. And it's all grounded in the love of Christ. If my heart hasn't been changed by the love of Christ, I can't live with my wife and show her the love that I need to show. See, the gospel impacts me as a husband. If you're here and you're not a Christian today, and you're a husband, like, you can be a good husband, but you can't be a godly husband. Does that make sense? Like, you can be a good husband, treat, treat her well, do nice things, and all that, and that's good, but you can't be a godly husband. You can love your wife, but you can't love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Like, you need to be changed by the gospel of Jesus. You need to admit that you're a sinner and that your sin separates you from God. And all the struggles you have in your relationship with your wife is because of the relationship of brokenness of relationship between you and God. And you need to get that relationship right first by admitting that you're a sinner and believing that Jesus died in your place for your sins and accepting him as your savior. And that's not going to make your marriage magically get better like you sprinkle some pixie dust on it and it's all better, but it's going to set you on the right trajectory. Because then you can begin to love your wife. And more importantly, then you have the power of the Holy Spirit, which is what every single man in this room needs to be the man that God called him to be. That's what we're shooting for. As we close, we're going to sing a song that says, My chains are gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, right? My chains are gone. And you think about it, man, what we need in order to be the men that God created us to be as we sing this song. I'm going to start by praying for us as men and as husbands. Again, if you have questions or concerns or thoughts, ladies as well, if you have things that you'd like to talk about, we are here and we're available. 
Um, we'd love to be able to do that. Uh, you can even send us an email. We want to want to help out. So I'm going to pray as the team comes forward. God, you set this whole thing up. You designed it. You know what you uh, expect from us. And as Christians and as husbands, um, we understand now in seeing from your word, we understand our job and our role. And God, I pray that we would all take it seriously. And I pray that you would give us the power of your Holy Spirit to do it well and do it in a way that we can't do it just on our own. God, I pray that, that each of us would take some application out of this to live with our wives in an understanding, respectful way. Uh, that we would be spiritually minded and that we would be moving in that direction. I pray that you would help those of who are here, God, whether it's uh, ladies or, or younger men or those who aren't married, God, um, I, I pray against a spirit of, of feeling either confused or disillusioned or discouraged. I pray that you would give encouragement from your word and that your Holy Spirit would give encouragement to everyone who's here um, in, in the application of this in the various ways. God, as we sing this song, I pray that you would impress our hearts with how much we need its truth. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together as we sing this last song of worship.